Hello, Cinnabar Moss, or any kind of moth you'd like to be. Welcome to the Writer's Triangle, Cinnabar Moss podcast about all things publishing and books. Today we are here with Dana Hammer, author of The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting. Dana, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. So are you feeling excited about the release of The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting? I'm super excited, yes. Uh, how long ago did you start writing or did you finish writing The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting? Yeah, so that's kind of a hard question to answer uh, because I think it was like 2012 when I first got the idea for it. Um, I wrote a short story about a heavily tattooed cannibal who likes to press wildflowers. And from there, it just kind of kept growing and growing. And then I wrote the first full novel like in 2016 or something like that. And it wasn't great. So I just kind of put it aside. And then um, during the pandemic, I decided I would pick it back up again and rewrite it. And so I guess it took several years to write it, but really most of that time I was not actually writing it, so. Okay, so it's an idea that (laughs) budded a long time ago, but then it just took a while to actually be something that you're actively working on rather than just letting it sit in the back of the mind. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And for that process, what would you say that process was like for you with starting it, stopping it, picking it back up? Well, um, I actually started it while I was on a writer's retreat with my writer's group. So it was just an idea that I had and I sort of passed it around the group and said, hey, would you write, would you read a story about this guy? Do you think he's a compelling character? And I got some feedback on it. Um, Mostly people were pretty positive about it. Um, And then I wrote the first draft and I workshopped that with some friends, uh, also from the same writer's group. Um, They had some pretty good suggestions about how to improve it, some of which I took, some of which I didn't. And yeah, 2020, I was just stuck in the house. And so I just hunkered down and rewrote the whole thing. Okay. And so it wasn't really, would you say that process was difficult for you or was it pretty smooth overall? It was difficult to, to make some of the more painful changes you know there's always characters you write who you get kind of attached to um and there are scenes who you or scenes that you really don't want to cut because they're so much fun to write and read and but in the end every scene has to serve a purpose in the book and sometimes you have to be ruthless and get rid of characters and scenes that you would rather keep but i always comfort myself that i can poach them and use them for something at a later date so that is true, yeah. Um, you have all these characters, you grow to love them, and then you have to be like, okay, you don't fit. I'll right. use you later, I promise. Yeah. It's okay. This just isn't your place. <laughs> You'll come up later. Right. And so you went through this process with writing The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting, and then when, about what time did would you say that you finished it? 2020, I think, is when I finished the final draft of it. Okay. And after that, you, what was, did you decide that you wanted to publish it and start looking for publishers? Yeah, um, pretty much a uh, used duotrope. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but it's basically like a service that lists different markets that publish things. And so I started looking around for a publisher who um, might be interested in it. And uh, I sent it to one publisher who thought it was a good book, but it wasn't the sort of thing that they published. They published more like mysteries. Mm. Uh, and my my book isn't really a mystery. So he actually referred me to you at Cinnabar Moth and you guys liked it. So that was great. <laughs> okay. So you had, you discovered us through a recommendation from a different publisher. Mm-hmm. And what made you decide in the end to publish with us? I loved how you were there was a nice personal touch with you guys you reached out and you were kind and you had good suggestions and you seemed like you really knew what you were doing and yeah I was really excited to work with you okay that's that's makes me happy to hear and I'm sure the rest (laughs) of the team will be happy to hear that as well and through this process of publishing with us what would you say has been the most surprising thing um I 
I don't know, honestly. I don't have a good answer for that question. Um, oh, I think it's been surprising because I've been sending out um, some advanced reader copies to people. And it's been surprising how like eager people are to help and, and how much people want to read the book. I think like as a writer, you're always kind of worried that people, you know, secretly don't like you or they secretly don't want to read your stuff. Um, but people have been really enthusiastic about wanting to uh, read the book and read a first draft and they've been really supportive. And I think that speaks to the horror community and how awesome they are. Uh, and I've been really surprised in a very good way at um, how enthusiastic people are about the book. So that's been great. Okay, so your surprise has been the level of acceptance and how open people are to your writing. Yeah, like I, I'll say, hey, I've got an advanced reader copy. You want to read it? And then someone will say, sure. Do you also want me to do a write-up for my magazine? Sure. Do you also want to be on my podcast? And I'm like, uh, yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> That's been really nice. It does sound like a very positive experience. And I'm glad that you're having this positive experience with the release of The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting. And speaking of its release, it's right around the corner now. How do you plan on celebrating it? That's a good question. I'm trying to convince my husband that we need to go up to um, Vichy Hot Springs up in Northern California. There's like a resort where you can, and supposedly the hot springs are like carbonated. Oh, so wow. I think that I want to go and like sit down under the stars with a glass of champagne and my carbonated water and celebrate my release but we'll see okay so you you haven't quite convinced him to sign up with the idea but that's what you're hoping for that's what i'm hoping for the resort's a little spendy but it's fine i, th I think i'll convince him <laughs> would you say that your family and your husband's been excited about the release of the book yeah yeah i think so um Unfortunately, my husband's not much of a reader and it's uh, an adult book, so my daughter can't read it either. <laughs> so, um, but I think they're excited for me and they, they're very happy that I'm happy. Okay, that's always nice. It is a bit unlucky that he's not much of a reader. Right. And <laughs> I, I think that happens sometimes, you know, not all of us read, even if we enjoy stuff and enjoy the people the things that people in our lives are doing is just not really for us. Yeah. But it sounds like he's been supportive anyway, and I think that that's always wonderful to have that support from family. Honestly, that's the most important thing to me, so. And with it being released, there's a lot of things that come with publishing a book, and there's a lot of things that come with the book coming out. Uh, one of those things is being listed in, or in libraries and being available via libraries. How does it feel to know that your book will be listed in the US Library of Congress? That feels awesome. I love that. I think that that's, you know, that's what every author wants. And I'm very excited for that to be happening for me. Oh, what does uh, being listed in the Library of Congress mean for you person? Do you have a connection with libraries at all with your history or is it something that's just kind of there? Oh, I loved libraries growing up. Of course, I have a connection with them. Um, you know, I, I lived in a fairly rural community and I wasn't too close to the library. So when I got to go, it was a very big event. It was really exciting. Um, and I can remember spending a lot of time, you know, reading bizarre things like ghost hunting books and um, things that maybe weren't <laughs> weren't super appropriate for kids. I liked a lot of horror books. I liked a lot of adult novels. Um, but those are all really good memories. And um, I love the idea that someone could go into a library and pick up my book and maybe have those same kind of memories. Yeah, so you have this uh, these positive memories libraries and hopefully People pick up the Campbell's Guide to Fasting. They'll have their journey to the library like you had yeah. and be able to say this book is something I remember fondly from, you know, my teenage years or or something. Right. <laughs> and so it's going to be published. It's about to come out this upcoming Tuesday. And uh, what do you hope happens next? 
I hope that it's successful. I hope that as many people read it as as possible, and I hope that people really enjoy it and relate to it. And um, yeah, I re I just kind of wanna I wanna see it fly and take wings and be a success. So on on the concept of success, what is success for you? Success for me means um, being respected for what I do. It's not necessarily like I don't really want to be famous ever. Um, I don't really care about that, but I want people to to respect me as a writer and feel that I'm good at it. And I want people to buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you are wanting writing to be a career for you? Absolutely. Okay. And so this is kind of the one of the steps along that journey towards writing as a career. Absolutely. So following up on that, that idea of success, if The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting were to become a, let's say, bestseller, what would you do? Well... <laughs> um <laughs> celebrate i guess and um yeah maybe send some copies to people who uh didn't like my writing back in the day i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be like hey remember me i'm remember kind of me? awesome now yeah i'm kind of a big deal <laughs> <laughs> so follow up on this idea of success you know it potential bestseller and then from there if a book's really popular it can potentially become a movie or a tv series if the cannibals kind to fasting were to become a movie or tv series do you have ideas of who you'd want to cast in that potential production i do so um for igor i it would have to be like a very big bodybuilder type guy like a john cena type um mm. Or maybe like The Rock, maybe one of those former pro wrestlers turned uh, actor. And for Esteban Zappa, I would like the guy who plays the most interesting man in the world. Do you remember those commercials? The beer commercials, uh, the most interesting man in the world? A bit, maybe, huh? faintly, yeah. Uh, the guy who plays that, he's Esteban Zappa. And um, Helen, I would like maybe Mindy Kaling to play Helen. I think that would be kind of cool. Um I don't have any strong opinions about who would play Ellie. I think Dr. Tran, Ali Wong would be good. Um, let's see. Yeah, those are kind of my main, um, the, my main ideas. Okay, so it sounds like you've got a decent idea of how all these characters sort of look and how you'd want them to feel yeah. when they're being portrayed on the screen. Most of them, yeah. <laughs> okay. And do you have a preference between a movie or a TV show for The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting? Well, you know, it's funny you should ask. I actually did, because um, I'm also a screenwriter, and I did write up a pilot uh, for The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting, just the first episode, thinking that maybe it could be like a fun limited series. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that it lends itself pretty well to a series as opposed to a movie. I'm not sure that you could fit everything into a movie and still have it um, carry all of the points and all of the details. But I mean, I guess that's a problem anytime you're adapting something to a movie, right? You're gonna have to leave a lot of stuff right. out. Um, but I would love to see it on either the big or the small screen. Okay. So from your perspective, with everything that goes on with the, the, the writing of the uh, in the book and all the different bits and pieces, a TV show would lend itself a lot more towards adapting that effectively. I think so. And I think that you could even do, um, you could move, it's like, like The Handmaid's Tale, you know, where you could move on past it and delve deeper into some of the backstories of the tertiary characters. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting world and I think there's a lot more to explore in it than I have done in just this novel. And I think either um, I'm going to have to write another novel or maybe uh, a television show would be a good way to extend it and explore some of the other areas. For instance, I think that it would be really cool to see what it's like inside the 
the rehab centers, uh, the cannibal rehab centers. I think that that in and of itself could be like a whole show. Mm-hmm. Kind of like Ratchet. <laughs> okay. And so let's imagine that it were to become a TV show. You you mentioned that you do uh, screenwriting as well. Would you want to have a high level of creative control in the process? Oh, I would love that. That would be my dream. I mean, I, I, I understand that that's not how it works, that sometimes you don't get a say in it, but I would love it if I could be uh, part of that process. Absolutely. Okay. And if you were part of that process, would you want to do the actual screenwriting or do you want to be more a consultant for it? What, what level exactly would you be looking for? Um, I would like to do the actual screenwriting, but... Um, I do understand that, you know, with filmmaking in particular, it's a collaborative process. It's not like a novel. So it does help to have other eyes on it and other perspectives. And I, um, I'm not so arrogant as to think that no one else could bring a fresh perspective and improve it. So I would be open to working with someone else or acting as a consultant. But, um, you know, the egoist in me wants to have full control. <laughs> so you ultimately you'd want to be able to control everything but you recognize yeah. hey that's that's a little bit unrealistic here let's reel it back yeah <laughs> let's not imagine it's gone through this entire process right it became a bestseller went on to a tv show went through the entire production process and yeah. it's now ready to come out would you want to go to the premiere and if you do go to the premiere who would you want to take with you of course I would want to go to the premiere that's like that would be like the height of my career I think um and um I don't know who I mean of course I would take my husband I think that that's you know the ideal date but you know then we'd have to pay for a babysitter so um but yeah no (laughs) I would take my husband I would take my husband okay so you take your husband hire a babysitter for the kid I, I'm, I'm sticking with that. Okay. That's the correct answer. <laughs> you mentioned before that you don't really want necessarily want to become famous, but when it, it comes to be getting a bestseller and ending up with a TV show and everything, there is a certain level of fame that does come with that, right? Sure. What level of fame would you feel that you're comfortable with? Would you like to be as famous as, for example, Stephen King, where you lost your anonymity? See, and sometimes I think that that would be wonderful, right? To be like this highly recognized writer. I can go into a bar and have free drinks and people will be super nice to me no matter what. But um, I'm not someone who likes a lot of scrutiny. Um, You know, sometimes I say insensitive things sometimes I dress badly you know it's um so I guess if I would I would accept it and I would be happy about it but I would have to um level up my style a little bit and uh learn how to be a little more um sensitive okay so you're okay with it if it happens but it's not necessarily your preference would that be correct it's not my goal Mm. Um, I would, I do want to have a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> so if I could have all of the money without the fame, that would be ideal. Um, that's really the goal is to make a huge amount of money. Um, but if people don't recognize my face, that I'm okay with that. Okay. So the the fame, you'll you'll take it or leave it. If it happens, it happens. But you're wanting to be able to have financial success from your writing being yeah. popular and people enjoying what you do. For sure. And so you've mentioned that money is the goal. Would you say that the your writing is oriented toward, you try to orient your writing towards trying to be popular with readers or you think about that a lot during your writing process? Well, that's what a smart writer would do, but no. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I just write whatever pops into my head and whatever is fun for me to write. I think that um, every time I've tried to write something for like uh, for someone else or something that fits into someone else's mold or tried to emulate another writer or tried to please others, it comes out 
very, very badly. Um, yeah, it almost sounds like I'm making fun of what I'm trying to write. And um, yeah, it's just not how I how I write, unfortunately. Well, I, I think that that style, having your own style and being able to produce your own voice is very important with writing, right? That's what separates you from other writers. Thank you. That's what I hope other people think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I think that's every writer's hope is to be able to say, I have my own unique voice and everybody loves my writing because it's my voice and it's me, right? That's the ultimate <laughs> goal. Yep. So you said that you write what's fun for you and what pops into your head. Would you say that your writing process is a bit all over the place or do you once you get an idea in your head you stick with it and you just keep writing that one story so i have actually like a notebook full of ideas and characters and just little little tidbits um and sometimes i'll go to that if i'm stuck and i need to like um add something interesting or something different to what i'm writing but i find that it's not a great idea to go to the list for my primary inspiration I think typically what I write is the ideas that won't go away, the ones that keep on popping into my head over and over again, um, the things that I don't need to put on a list, you know what I mean? Like the things that I just, I have to write it and it has to get out. Okay, so you have kind of this core of things that you're constantly thinking of, this would be really cool to write, that you go to as your first step and then you if you're going through that process of writing out that story fleshing it out you're like i need a little bit of extra you have a list that you go back to to kind of jog your your right. uh, mental process and your writing process a little bit yeah like if it starts to get a little bit dull or if i start to feel a little unexcited by the plot i can go to my list and say oh what if i added a knife thrower you know <laughs> something like that I mean, knife throwing is very exciting. I'll give you knife that. Knife throwing is the best. Yeah, I've never actually experienced uh, a knife throwing performance in person. I've seen videos and such of it, but I've never experienced it myself. One of my goals is to learn how to throw a knife really well. I want to be like one of those really cool Bill the Butcher from Gangs in New York where I can just like throw it and hit a target and super badass someday <laughs> someday when i don't have a small child around the house when someday when it's safe to have a bunch of knives <laughs> right exactly that makes sense yeah i do think that having that as a hobby when you have a small child children are a little bit too inquisitive for their own good a lot of the time yeah Maybe not I just, like all the emergency room visits and whatnot add up <laughs> and so Dana, I'd like to thank you for talking with me today and be on the Writer's Triangle. And thank you so thank much you. for having me. Thank you for writing the wonderful book that is The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting. And thank you to all of our beautiful moms for listening. Be sure to buy The Cannibal's Guide to Fasting coming up this coming out this upcoming Tuesday, uh, September 6th, 2022. Uh, Dana, why don't you tell everybody uh, the listeners as well as me, where we can find you. Okay, um, you can find me on my website, which is www.danahammer.com. I'm also on Facebook at Dana Hammer Author Page. Um, and I don't really use Twitter or Instagram because I'm old and lame. But if you want to find me on either of those other two uh, platforms, I'm there. Uh, on Twitter, are you at Dana Hammer? I am not on Twitter. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not at all. Okay. No. I tried it once. It wasn't my thing. That makes sense. I think I personally also struggle with Twitter. I have one, but I I don't use it. I might as well not have one. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it's just people being mean really fast. I, I think that there's different communities in Twitter. I've Some people have had very positive experience with it. I personally did not. You know, it's yeah. not for everybody. Yeah. But for everybody but, who's listening now currently, you can find Dana Hammer at the aforementioned website and Facebook. And be sure to visit cinnabarmoth.com to check out the transcripts. And we'll also have the links to Dana Hammer's social media. Uh, Dana, once again, thank you for talking to me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. 
and bye-bye. Bye.